Good morning, Professor Spooner. How are you? Good morning, Frank. I'm fine, thanks, and I hope you are too. Thank you. Uh, we're uh, talking together this morning at a time when the world seems to be uh, getting into a bigger and bigger mess. Uh, the uh, the worst thing that happened in the last couple of weeks is the shootings in Germany, which um, I and uh, I got. Uh, to know Germany and lived in Germany for a while 50 years ago and uh, always have always thought of it as the most orderly country in the world mm -hmm. and now security can be a problem there as well mm -hmm. and of course security can now be a problem anywhere uh, whereas uh, 50 years ago I could wander about any part of the world and not worry about security um, but um, it, it seems to me that everything that I used to be able to depend upon and have depended upon and uh, everything uh, that um, used to work perfectly well up until quite recently, not much less than 50 years ago, although the process has been increasing since then, uh, you can't depend upon anymore. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it, it just seems as though there's too much of everything. Um, and whether it starts with there being too many people, because we've had so much uh, unprecedented population growth in the last 150 years or so, or something else, I'm not sure. Uh, so certainly, um, uh, the fact that um, a general awareness of the increasing numbers or every part of the increasing global population has something to do with it. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that, uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the election in 2016 here would have, would have come out differently uh, 20 years ago than it did now, simply because of the um, people who are voting and how they decide um, who to vote for. Uh, but then um, I look at every look at other things besides politics and I find that uh, we've there's there's too much information so we can't if we're uh, failing to organize the information that we have and uh, it's very difficult to um, work out um, how to choose the information that how to select the information that you need and um, uh, uh, and still also be aware of the information that you don't need. And then I look around me in my house and we've got too much stuff. Um, it's almost impossible anymore to uh, maintain a well-ordered life, uh, both in, uh, uh, in, the, in the psychological sense and in the physical sense. Uh, so one wonders what this is actually leading to as the population continues to grow, even though the rate of growth is declining. Nevertheless, um, it, it's still having the same sorts of effects. The political systems aren't working in the way that we have been uh, given us confidence in them in the past. Uh, the health systems aren't working. Uh, so we we still don't know what's going to happen with this coronavirus, and another there was another death in South Korea um, overnight, uh, and it's becoming less and less. I mean, the the authorities are becoming less and less confident that they can contain it. Um, so what's next? Well, let let me, let me ask you a question. All right. Um... I'm acutely aware of the fact that the two of us uh, have a lot of gray hair. Um, if uh, if we had uh, two uh, 25 to 30 year olds um, on this discussion with us, and I know you have interaction uh, on a regular basis with younger people because of your possession, position as a professor, would they would they share this view, or or is this just two older people? Uh, lamenting how the world has changed from when we were younger. I mean, do they share the idea that there's too much information, that the information is uh, so difficult to make sense of, that there's too much of everything, that everything is too confusing, that 
there's a breach of confidence in our institutions that uh, events just keep succeeding themselves so quickly that people just tune out. What What is the mindset of the people who are going to inherit this mechanism that we have inherited from our forebears? Do you know? That's a very good question. And of course, I have my my daughter and her partner living in my house with me now. Okay. <laughs> And uh, I can say something about what I observe um, in their lives. Uh, but uh, um, later on today, I'll actually pose the question to them. Okay. But I think that the issue is that they've grown up with it. And of course, we grew up with something different and are trying to keep, keep up with what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, so I think their expectations are very different from ours. Uh, but what that means for the future is uh, something, is a question that uh, uh, I can't uh, answer, I'm afraid. Um, I think that, um, uh, well, one, one thing, of course, is that um, the, in the 1960s, um, uh, especially, but starting in the 50s and going on into the 70s and even to, to some extent into the 80s, um, uh, young people were interacting with each other to a larger and larger extent all over the world. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, of course, that increased even more in the 90s with um, Facebook right. and social media. Um, so uh, there was a, a great deal of, of um, social interaction among young people then. Now, I think there's much less. Uh, it, despite social media, uh, I think that uh, the, the way social media are used now, um, in fact, uh, are not so universal. Uh, people aren't traveling. Yep. Uh, because travel is no longer secure and they have less and less they let know less and less about the rest of the world um, and in in any case i think that americans always knew less about the rest of the world than than other westerners did um, uh, there's too much water on either side of america to no no that's <laughs> true travel, yeah. travel was no but was not as easy as it was for people in England, France, or Germany. Um, so the the big question is, and it brings us back to the the issue we've talked about in the past, which is organisation. Um, so far, we have no institutional forms of uh, organisation uh, for to to bring people together to do things together. Uh, beyond the nation state, except the United Nations, which really doesn't achieve very much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, there has to be in the future some sort of global institutions uh, or institutionalization. Well, the, these are uh, the, the these these are the 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 hopes of of our generation. All right. Um, and I, I guess what I'm thinking is that if these hopes are not shared by the generation that's going to be here 25 years from now and in control, then these hopes are, are completely irrelevant. They're dashed because that generation is going to focus on on what's important to it. I mean, it's it's almost as if we look at, at, at Europe after the Roman Empire disintegrated for 400 years or so. It was content to, to to sit there in the dark, not, not to use a horrible metaphor, although I know an awful lot was going on during the dark ages, but people were content with what they knew and uh, uh, social systems proceeded, albeit very differently than they were before. And I, I guess I'm just, I'm wondering how much of what we discussed this way um, is really something that's shared in in feeling and in perception by the generation that's going to succeed us because that that's well, really that's where the rubber's going to meet the road isn't it i mean the, this is what well, 
one thing has improved, and that is that it was only in the 1950s that the idea was introduced that we that people should, all, all people should learn foreign languages. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, it was a new idea when people was started international travel in the middle of the last century. Uh, and now, uh, of course, there are international languages, languages that are spoken all over the world. Um, but the political organization has uh, seems to have progressed in the other direction because we, uh, we have so many countries now that are dominated by one supreme leader, mm. whether it's uh, Erdogan or Duterte or Trump or uh, Modi or I mean, one can go on and on yeah, with these yeah, people. The long who list. Yeah. Uh, I, I guess I'm so, just, I, I guess I. I I'm in contact with, with people uh, under the age of 35, let's put it like that on a regular basis. And, um, and they, uh, they have no interest in this. Uh, it's no. astounding to me. I mean, uh, their, their interests are uh, maybe one or two concentric circles beyond their immediate uh, family. And, uh, and those interests then usually extend only into uh, their, their view of what culture is. Which which I don't share it to be culture. I view it as something else. But you know they'll discuss <laughs> movies or music or, uh, or or other things. And but they they don't they they seem to have a very insular view of of the world. And I, I'm wondering. I, I'm not making any judgments about that. But I I just I I don't understand if they have that view because of uh, an inherent frustration in the way things are and a recognition that there's really no order or method to this madness that the world has become and they're focusing on things closer to home or whether perhaps it's it's the other symptom whether or not the the way the the reason the world is the way it is is because this succeeding generation doesn't have that sort of a world kind of view any longer as as did we as did you and me so i i don't know it, it just struck me as you were going through that litany of things that aren't working i think that the reason that things are developing like this is that um it's no longer possible or at least it's extremely difficult and it would become a a, a scientific specialization to really be uh, up to date on everything that's going on in the world. I would agree. Uh, whereas we used to think that 50 years ago that we could be up to date on everything significant that was going on in the world. Uh, and so the um, uh, everybody selects what they what they think is worth paying attention to, mm -hmm. and the selection is not done scientifically. It's done as a matter of um, uh what you get used to in your day-to-day -day life mm -hmm. and what you need to know in order to live your day-to-day -day life mm -hmm. um so i think that that day-to-day -day life uh is be becoming the center of attention uh, uh with with an unf uh, unfortunate implications that the organization of the world is getting no attention yeah, i agree with you uh, this is going to have to change sooner or later, but just exactly how it will change is difficult to tell. Whether there'll be some sort of revolution, uh, not I don't mean necessarily a violent revolution, but a, a revolution in the way of thinking, uh, starting from the younger generation, uh, even though, of course, we now have an older generation than we ever had before, uh, of people with much more... Um, longer term experience of the way things are changing mm -hmm. so this makes it all all these things make it that much more difficult for us people like us to predict what might happen in the future uh i don't want to sound pessimistic <laughs> because, no, because I'm, you're an optimist <laughs> i'm basically an optimist uh but it's very difficult to uh uh work out what the most likely uh um, processes are for the coming uh, for the rest of this century. Well, just as a final question, when when you and your globalization uh, seminars are are speaking to uh, groups of people in their mid twenties, and you talk as you've been talking over these sessions, what is what is their reaction? Do, do they do they share that view, or or is this something that? 
they, they don't agree with? Uh, are you able to get any feedback? Well, they don't tell me what they think. Mm -hmm. They uh, ask questions about what I'm telling them. <laughs> I see. Uh, uh. Uh, which is, uh, again, um, not what one would expect. No, because from a social and anthropological perspective, I'm, I'm wondering if, if they begin to come back and say, we don't see a problem. This is perfectly fine the way things are. We're content to live this way. This is fine. Then I'm I'm wondering. However, well, tell me about the, the however. The, these these courses that were one that I've been teaching for 20 years, got just called globalization in historical perspective, uh, and the other one that I've been teaching for uh, getting on for 10 years called global food security. Uh, attract more and more students every year so that we've got more than 200 students in each course. Interesting. So it, they obviously want to know what's going on, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but they don't contribute to the discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, however, I think I'm going to have to, um, uh, uh, well, and I actually do ask them to, to begin the course by telling me what they think. Right, right. Right, um, but I don't get much out of them. Well, we're going to have to we're going to have to wait with bated breath for the report of uh, your conversation with your daughter and her partner. So <laughs> okay. We'll look we'll look forward to that one at least next week. And meanwhile, I too will uh, spend some time uh, zeroing in with these people I know who are 35 years old and and try to get their uh. their impressions of things, because I'm I'm just I'm a little flummoxed because if 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 30 years from now these people are running our societies and governments and don't think that there's any problem, then by definition, you could make a compelling case that there will not be or is not a problem. If it's well, the if question it's, is in 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 uh, the, the uh, in a few decades from now, will it be the 90 and 100 nonagenarians and centenarians running the world, or the or the young people? Well, you can run it. I'm not going to be running it. I, I need a break. So, all right, Professor Spooner, as always, thank you very much for your time, and uh, we'll talk soon. See you next week. Thank you. Bye.